Hidden in the depths of the mind is a secret tomb where knowledge, fear, mystery, and a macabre sense of enjoyment is held. Each corner is resplendent with its own curiosities, and each curiosity appeals to a different soul. You're listening to The Crypt of the Unknown, a podcast that discusses the realms of the horrific and the fantastic in print, games, or on the screen. And now, introducing you to the Guardians of the Crypt, your tour guides, here are Webb and Stefan J.D. Greetings, weary travelers, to the Crypt of the Unknown, a podcast where we discuss the mysterious, the fascinating, and the horrific. My name is Webb the Critical Android, and joining me, my friend and colleague, Stefan J.D. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Hi, <laughs> Stefan J.D. Hi, everybody. <laughs> How you doing, my friend? Ah, uh, waking up at one in the morning. <laughs> flammable means inflammable? What kind of country is this? What kind of country? Oh, uh, Dr. Nick reference is there for everybody who uh, was tuning in for a horror-related podcast expecting a Simpsons reference right off the bat. <laughs> That's how it works. <laughs> It is how it works here. Well, we discuss a lot of random things, and this one that we have set up for today is definitely one of the more outside-the-box things, but one that I really wanted to, to bring up because this is something that horrified me as a child, and I think is an untapped well of, of interest that we could look into to see like these paranormal events of the past and then bring them into current day. Uh, and I'm referring to a program called Sightings which was a television series that lasted for five seasons. It ran from approximately 1991 to 1998. And you, you hadn't heard of the show before I brought it up to you, had you, Stefan? No, I had not. I, I want to try to explain this to people, and I think the best point of reference is not quite Unsolved Mysteries, but if anybody had watched shows like 2020 or 48 Hours or Dateline, where you would have a, a news anchor who would then talk about how they had these different um, events of the, of the week or the month or whatever they were discussing. A lot of these would be investigations that they literally would send crews out to. And for instance, on Dateline, they might talk about maybe a consumer interest thing about a defective vehicle or problems that were going on at a manufacturing plant. And then they might have another thing that they do in another segment where they talk about maybe a crime case or uh, some sort of injustice happening in the criminal justice system, or maybe a public interest piece about a controversial television show or, you know, something of the, that sort. <laughs> like, and uh, next uh, coming up is Mortal Kombat. Yeah, kind of, something yeah. like that. Destroying the generation, the youth. I don't know. Something else that's positive. About <laughs> <Mortal> Kombat. <laughs> well, well, you know, uh, like 2020 was a big show for that. They had Barbara Walters and Hugh Downs for the longest time. And they would discuss like various big things in the news and, and do this hard hitting journalism. But it was never quite as hard as like 60 Minutes because that was like the big one. Sightings would be kind of like Dateline or 2020 with a news anchor named Tim White. But the ex the difference between this show and the other ones would be that they would do these legitimate news investigation about paranormal events. And I think you you can see exactly what I'm talking about, uh, Stefan, when I had you watch one of these episodes about how this is like one of those serious news pro programs where they're presenting everything straight serious, but it's ridiculous the stuff that they talk about. Yeah, it's almost like if people are fans of Ghostbusters, and we've seen Ghostbusters 2, and they remember the show that Peter Vakeman does at the beginning of the movie, uh, World of the Spectacular or Weird or whatever it is that, he's, that it's called, it's literally that. It is, like, Peter Vakeman is, you know, a fraud, obviously, in that movie. The guy who's in this show, he actually means it. Like, he's taking everything seriously, and it's it's given to you, just like you said, Webb. Like, they, they mean it. Everything that's going on in the show, they're, they're playing it for serious. And none of this is taken as a joke, because it started off as a, a series of specials that occurred talking about, like, specific events related to UFOs. Because UFOs have been a phenomena that's been around for, but honestly, for, for centuries, probably. Um, mm. But for the very least, in terms of popular culture, the Roswell incident was a huge thing. 
it's been filtered in the news for a while. The the U.S. government had Project Blue Book, where they were actually investigating and sending people out to like document UFOs, all that stuff. And I think before we get into sightings directly, it would be helpful if we said something here quick about maybe where we stand on things like UFOs. Let people know about what we actually think. Because I think you and I, we both consider ourselves open-minded and willing to listen to arguments about things. Absolutely. 100%. But how do you feel about the possibility of UFOs? So basically, it would feel impossible to me to think that in the known universe that there is not something that exists that's, you know, whatever it is, whatever kind of life form it is, that there is something out there. Do I subscribe to the fact that there have been UFOs on the planet Earth? It's a possibility. I've never seen one. It's almost uh, going back to being an agnostic in religion. You know, I've never seen God. But people say he's there, <laughs> you know, but I've never seen him. And it kind of is the same thing logically with aliens. If I saw an alien, I'd believe in an alien. I haven't seen one, but, but people tell me they exist. Uh, one of the things we do get from the government uh, recently is that they did announce that there have been unidentified flying objects that they don't know what they were. Does that mean aliens? Not necessarily, but that's also information that's been given to us recently. Yes, I agree with you in the sense that I believe that there is another form of life out there somewhere. I am going to go on the record of saying that I don't think any of them have actually visited Earth. I think that the UFO sightings that we have are more than likely some sort of either A- just uh, aerial phenomen uh, phenomenon. It could just be anything from, I don't know if you want to say, like, stars or reflections or things that are passing through the sky, space debris, whatnot. Uh, but I think more than likely, most UFO incidents that people are seeing are from government craft that are being tested or some sort of aircraft in general. U-2 spy planes for decades and governments, as much as we... As much as government ineptitude is uh, rampant, because there, there's a lot of ineptitude in government, but private <laughs> private contractors trying to develop things for the military, hoping that they'll buy things, that's legitimate. Like, whether it be government contracts or just aspiring for a government contract, that's all legitimate stuff. So you can have private corporations who are trying to develop aircraft or develop technology that they're hoping to sell for the government. And that's, you know, a perfectly legitimate reason why they wouldn't want to talk about it, because those are business dealings. You feel well, no, uh, probably full well know uh, when it comes to any kind of a, a business dealing. Most of those deals, the companies like to keep them private until the deal is completed, because the more this gets talked about, uh, the more it can affect things like stocks and negotiations and business deals in general. So all that stuff tends to be under wraps just for the sake of privacy to make sure the deal is completed and that that information technology doesn't leak out. Right. We don't want any scrutiny for giving weapons of mass destruction to terrorists ah, because that yeah. would be bad. Of course, we would <laughs> never do that. Never. <laughs> but see, that's the thing. A lot of stuff involving government secrets and whatnot can be done and this should not be talked about, not because of any kind of a sense of like not wanting the public to know things and uh, for fear of like, you know, government control over our lives, but just because governments sometimes need to keep secrets from other people because that's the way we roll. It's, you know, you can debate the ethics of it all you want, but that's what happens. Oftentimes you just keep things secret so other governments don't know about the shit that you're doing. Yeah, plus you can't have James Bond if you don't have any secrets. Exactly. I mean, we all love James Bond. <laughs> right. And he's not an alien. He's not trying to hurt anybody. He's just got a license to kill, but only the bad guys. Only the bad guys. Yeah. Uh, but what about ghosts? What's your feeling on ghosts? It's hard for me to say because I do at some point want to talk about my experiences with the paranormal. Um, I have one or two. But those, again, did not convince me 100% that there are such things as ghosts. And I've heard many accounts from people who said differently and their stories seemed, you know, like, uh, they seemed possible. I mean, in the way they explained it, like, they vividly would remember uh, the account of it. Me, personally, I still don't know. Uh, the day I see one is the day I'll believe. I guess uh, I'm like Mulder. I want to believe the truth is out there. <laughs> I, I also know people who have seen ghosts. Um, my brother has definitely had an experience like that, that 
very much changed and shaped his outlook on on the supernatural like that. Personally, have I seen one? Um, probably not. Uh, like, I, I think for anything unusual I did see, there's probably some sort of a, a rational explanation. The way I look at it with with ghosts in terms of like, there's millions of ghost sightings that have been reported across the world, across countries, for centuries. So, is it distinctly possible that ghosts exist? I would say yes. I would actually probably give ghosts more credence than aliens having visited Earth. Yeah, and there's a lot of ghost equipment now that people have been working on, and, you know, people saying they got ectoplasm and other things, other substances and sensations and video recordings and there's it feels like there's maybe a lot more evidence to give support to the uh, idea of ghosts and the paranormal as opposed to ufos especially today you could photoshop anything uh maybe you know with the paranormal if somebody actually experienced it and you saw them every time you brought it up like go into like a raving streak and lose their mind because they just didn't want to remember the count of it now that would seem like something more believable. Stat, I wouldn't want to do that to somebody, but you know, in, in that circumstance, it, it seems more relevant for some reason. Uh, it's one of those things where I think we have to, you know, are, are most ghost sightings probably explainable by something else? Yeah, probably. Uh, but are all of them? Maybe not. We should try to take things with a degree of fact finding, of wanting to go into it saying, you know what, maybe this is true. Maybe it's false, but the only way we can know is to treat it with an open mind and tackle it like that. Sightings tended to lean more on the side of saying as true and not try to, like, you know, discourage people from believing otherwise. Right. It just literally gives you the information, lets you decide. This information that it throws at you at an alarming rate, because this show is a half an hour show and it has to get so much packed in that... It's just like, boom, 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 boom. On next. Boom, boom, boom. (laughs) Uh, I love it, though. I love that. (laughs) This particular episode that we're watching is from season two of the show. And according to Wikipedia, this would be season two, episode nine. Uh, I don't know for sure if it is because, you know, Wikipedia with older shows is not always accurate. Uh, But if it is season two, episode nine, there's three segments that occurred in this episode. Uh, One is a UFO investigation that takes place in Russia. Another is uh, what they call the Ghost of Whitechapel, or in this case, the Ghost of the Ten Bells Inn, or pub. And they also do a, um, just a weird story about an Iceman that was found. (laughs) Well, and not Iceman, the uh, the Mega Man robot either. (laughs) Or uh, Iceman slash Encino Man, either. <laughs> or Iceman from Top Gun. Uh, it's not... <laughs> oh, man. Give that guy some bubble <laughs> <laughs> No, they're, they're talking uh, about an actual, like, frozen uh, corpse that they found in 1991. I want to start talking about this UFO investigation that happens in Russia, because it's actually kind of interesting. Yeah, I want to say that this is the core story of the episode. Russia being a strange place already just because of (laughs) the things that I've encountered that have to do with anything Russian related. Uh, First off, I saw the uh, great documentary Chernobyl and very sad. You know, the whole story is sad. The whole thing that happened to the country is awful. And also playing the stalker games, the PC games, which kind of feel relevant to even the show because In the Stalker games, it takes place in Chernobyl. There's this place called The Zone where paranormal things happen in the video game. And much like in Sightings, the same thing happens in Russia, but it's called the M-Triangle Zone. Yes, and this is something that when you're watching a show that's ridiculous as Sightings, you have to wonder, okay, how much of this is just shit they're making up versus how much of this is real? I don't know how you approach this, but when I read about the M-Triangle, I immediately just did a Google search for the (laughs) M-Triangle. Yeah. And as it turns out, this is a real, like, reported area where crazy shit seems to happen. It's still currently, if you look up the M-Triangle online, you will find articles about it as being a UFO hotspot. Yeah, the UFOs um, apparently are very dangerous for some reason. They don't specifically say why they're dangerous, but they say that they're constant. And uh, people sometimes get these superpowers from being around them. 
They never explain what the superpowers are, I don't think. As far as I can recall, if you can recall differently, Webb, but they do say that they're dangerous, constant, and give people some sort of power by being around them. Yeah, uh, they talk about this one individual who was apparently a journalist who also became a cosmonaut named Pavel Mokratov. He is interviewed in this episode, and I looked him up. He is a, he's a legitimate person who's listed. Uh, there's a German website called spacefacts.de, and they have him listed here as a cosmonaut who was uh, a research cosmonaut. So not somebody who would really go up into orbit, but somebody who was more maybe doing like groundwork, things like that. So they have him listed as an actual, uh, actual person who was you know, working for the Russian space government. He's describing in the episode the fact that he used to be this, like, out-of-shape person who did not have much physical stamina, and then somehow he visits this area, and he meets with these glow-in-the-dark aliens. Uh, and this was actually got reported in People magazine. An article was written from October 30th, 1989, about this guy. And they're talking about how these creatures, similar to humans, who also had a small robot with them, <laughs> came out, and uh, they started talking with these children who were playing soccer, and then apparently they abducted one of them who was 16 years old, and he then, like, he disappeared, and then they rematerialized. Uh, it's really crazy, this article that that's being read, and it was reported in the actual Russian news that this thing, that this event happened. Yeah, I, I'm kind of curious if the robot looked like the one from Rocky Three, or if they have better robots. I'm just really curious what it would be. It's like Paulie, just like, that's where he got the robot from. He got it from the aliens. <laughs> yeah, I, you know. Hey, just... Paulie, where are you spending all my money on? I didn't spend money on a rock. The aliens came to me. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me, sir. Did you just see a bright light? <laughs> 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 that would have made Rocky Five so much better if Rocky was just going after the aliens who gave Polly the robot. Polly comes up and oh. like, Rocky took the robot back. <laughs> well, man, he took the robot the back. It was your robot, Polly. You can't take it back. <laughs> Yo, Adrian, you see an alien? What? <laughs> this, oh god, that would have been so much better than the Tommy Gun Morrison thing. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. Uh, this is, again, going back to <laughs> people with physical strength. Um, the Russians there not only, you know, had strength, but they apparently feel like they're seeing a hallucination. Some of them did describe some of this as hallucinations. And one of the main reasons why people think that they might be suffering from hallucinations is because there's some uranium or something in the mountains nearby, because it's in the Ural Mountains of Russia. And there's something there that hasn't been mined yet that possibly could be poisoning them which doesn't make sense because they've lived there for quite a while apparently they've also said it's the possibility that they could have been that the russian government could have been using that area because of its remoteness for testing of different spacecraft they were trying to develop it's basically like a, a russian version of area 51 could that be a possibility Perhaps. And, you know, depending on what they're trying to use to power these things, if they are trying to use some sort of like advanced nuclear energy or even just not advanced, but just like nuclear energy in general, then there is legitimately a concern for radiation in that area if that were the case. Or there are certain places where things like naturally occurring radiation like radon or like you said, just a kind of a radioactive material in general could it could be a hotbed for that which could be affecting people's mental state and it's so tucked away out in the middle of nowhere that it, it seems like it could be a perfect spot for that to be happening and be remote enough to where people wouldn't give it much attention yeah and that sounds about right that sounds like something a government would do you know area 51 is definitely in the desert you know why not put it in some place that's remote where there's not a lot of people that are going to ask a lot of questions you know one of the other things that they they do during this episode of sightings is they actually when they're interviewing like little children, because they get this like grouping of little kids, which reminds me of like gangs in Russia. They always say like little kids will get together and beat the shit out of you. <laughs> like if, if you don't give them gum or something, or maybe I'm remembering a movie. <laughs> but <laughs> uh, they, they they literally interview these kids and there's a pack of them. They say, you know, yeah, we're we're bored with the aliens now. We're bored with the sightings. And when I go to bed, I try to ignore them. And this kid is like straight faced giving us this information. He really believes in it. He's really seen it, apparently. And they do, the cameras for sightings do get this weird streak of light in the sky on their own cameras. They say, hey, look at that. What was that streak of light? 
you know, again, it could have been a shooting star, could have been anything, you know, but it tries to take itself seriously. And I find it very fascinating because these people do not seem like they're acting and they're not. They're legitimately saying their accounts of what's happened. The other thing that could explain a lot of this is a changing policy that was happening in Russia around this time. It's like glasnost. I'm still butchering it a little bit. But this this term is more directly translated to a form of openness and transparency. So at the time that this was happening, government control over the media was relaxing. And for the for a while, newspapers, which were, you know, in, in 89, were the primary source of information aside from news programs, like televised, you could finally have them printing things that were not just government-controlled messages that were being disseminated to the people. They were actually relaxing because Gorbachev was kind of like appealing to the sense of opening up the people uh, and giving more freedom. After decades of Soviet-controlled media, people were finally getting this chance to report other stories – and I think there may easily have been a case of, like, one-upsmanship trying to happen where they'd be clamoring for attention. So you could have one publication being like, we have aliens. And you could have another one being, we have a creature from ground that rises up and takes children, drags him to hell. You could just <laughs> be reporting anything you wanted now because you had that, that opportunity. So I think that's why some of these people were so happy to be, like, talking about what their experiences were. Even if, you know, they weren't legitimate paranormal phenomena but just things that they interpreted to be that way was because they had the opportunity to embrace that kind of freedom for a change um speaking from my own personal uh eye view of this as well you know when you hear something on the news you don't specifically should ever outright believe it you should always question every piece of information that's given to you in life here in arizona at one time they did report on the news you know hey there's these things called the arizona lights or phoenix lights yeah, and there are these things, these lights that just hover. And I went outside, sure enough, I saw hovering lights. Didn't really look like anything in particular, but it also didn't look like anything extraterrestrial. So, again, I'm going to have to point to the fact that I'm not 100% sure how much you know validity there is to this or what the truth lies in in a different country. And again, going back to their news reports about one-upping, one it's a possibility. Anything's a possibility. Even after seeing something with my own eyes, I still question it. And I think everyone should. Yeah, the Phoenix Lights that you're talking about, they were... This happened back in 1997. At least the most uh, the most prevalent example of this happening was in 1997, when a lot of people reported like a V-shaped pattern of lights in the sky. This is one of the more famous UFO sightings in the United States. And you can find pictures of it online, and it looks eerily like some sort of like the crest of the side of a ship uh, in the air when you see these lights. The official explanation for them was that it was a series of flares that were being dropped by uh, test flights that were passing through that area. And the V fe- uh, the V formation would have been from, you know, a, a, f- uh, a pattern of planes in the air flying in a V formation, dropping flares simultaneously. Is that a reasonable explanation for what could have happened? Possibly. I- yeah, I think so. Let me put it this way. When it comes to explanations, is that a likely explanation versus craft, alien craft, just hovering in the air? Yeah, I'll outside more with the idea that it's flares being dropped as opposed to anything else. Could it be something else? Possibly. But that's why we look at everything from those perspectives. Could these people in Russia have been seeing things that were completely, you know, from outside of this, this Earth? Quite possible. Or could it be people who saw just maybe a natural phenomenon, maybe a shooting star, maybe a a government craft, and then just extrapolated this into a a larger story because for the first time in their lives, they could actually report this stuff and know they could get into the news? That, to me, seems like a far more likely explanation. Yeah, and I will agree with that. You know, these things, again, I'm just not so sure, but... This is, uh, it would be harder to fake it, I would say, back then than now, because it was the 90s, and, you know, obviously, computer technology, blah, 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 we can even, you know, I could put my face on your body web, and it could melt right in and, you know, look perfect, you know, so it, it it's it's come a long ways, but these things would definitely be harder to fake back then, 
you know, we have to give we have to give some credit to the idea that, you know, there might be a possibility of anything, but as far as we know, we it's it doesn't seem. Sightings also re- uh, reported that there was in Russia at the time a very popular show that was being uh, hosted that talked about the UFO phenomena, hosted by a, a figure in the Russian news media who was fairly popular. But because it was Russia in like late 80s, early 90s, I couldn't find any footage of the show. I tried. And I tried looking up the host, but nothing much there either. But, you know, again, that's because, you know, this was Russia in the very early 90s and late 80s. How many people are going to have VHS tapes of that show that they recorded and then like years later went, they should upload UFO show to YouTube? I highly doubt they would. <laughs> Yeah, if I were on the sightings team, I would have reported this more from the sense of, hey, here's this perspective on what the Russians saw or what they reported they saw, but what's actually happening in the country right now that's making them so eager to report this? Because once you, even though they're interviewing these people who work with like the Russian space program, because there's even a woman that they interviewed, she passed away not too long ago, a Russian female cosmonaut who trained people, and she was very active in the Russian program, Marina Popovich. Uh, She died in 2017 at the age of 86. Apparently, she became the third woman and the first Soviet woman to break the sound barrier uh, as a test pilot. So she was was known as Madame Mig because of her work in Soviet fighters. Uh, She set more than 100 aviation world records on over 40 types of aircraft, and she was a huge... A supporter of UFO information. Apparently she talked about it in, in interviews and everything, and you see her talking about it in sightings where she fully believes that UFOs exist. So we're not talking about somebody who is just uh, some wingnut who, who doesn't, you know, who, who's just like some fly-by-night inexperienced person. This is a legitimately highly trained and very capable pilot and trainer who not only believed in these things... It believed in UFOs for the sake of attention. It appears that she honestly fully believed in this because she was talking about this years and years after the Russian news media opened themselves up for, for private reporting. Yeah, that's very interesting. I actually didn't catch that bit of information. I had to dig deeper to find out about, uh, find out about Marina here. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, and good for her for doing all that. That's a lot of credit. Yeah, it's huge. So if you're, you know, you can find her pretty much online pretty easily because she was active in things until uh, around the time of her death. So again, she she only passed away in 2017 and apparently she wrote books about UFOs, gave a lot of speeches. That that kind of lends cre- uh, credence to that perspective that maybe this isn't all just people just trying to make it into the news. She, they may have had legitimate experiences. These people, when they're interviewing them, they don't look like they're there to pass off some fake story. They just look like they're there. They're almost annoyed that they're being asked because they've had to deal with it so much. That's what they look like, honestly. They said something about that, too, about how a lot of these people was just so common to them now that we're living in that triangle area. That was just like, you know, we're getting bored of it. You know, my final thoughts on it are really just that it's a possibility, but there's also many factors to account for that possibility and those people feeling that way and whatever they saw. Because from my perspective... You never know till you know, and we don't know. And that's that's sightings, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> well, the next section they did was about a pub called the Ten Bells. Ah, uh, the Ten Bells, famous for <laughs> this guy called Jack the Ripper. <laughs> Who? What? <laughs> yeah, I, it's this strange. guy just like, like tearing paper. <laughs> I believe he was active during the late eighteen hundreds, and um, what they're and th- again, this go- this information goes by really fast, but basically what they throw out there right in the beginning is at 10 Bells, they keep seeing this old lady ghost in the window on the second floor. And a lady actively says, maybe a murder was committed, maybe not. <laughs> so they're not even asking people who are right off the bat going out right and saying, yeah, you know, there's a ghost, there's a murder, blah, blah, blah. There's some people who are like, ah, maybe. But I think her name was Elizabeth Stride, right? I think it was. Yeah, I think it's Elizabeth Stride. They called her Long Liz. And she was supposedly the third victim of Jack the Ripper. Yes, the third victim. You are correct. I'm just double checking it right now. Reported as killed in Whitechapel, which is the area where uh, Jack was active and where the Ten Bells is. 
It's funny enough, uh, Sightings decides to get a psychic in on this episode who randomly says that the Ten Bells is definitely the place and that there were many Ripper suspects, which famous to the lore and uh, story of what happened back then, there were a lot of people who became suspects as Jack the Ripper. Yeah, it's, well, yeah. I mean, uh, Jack the Ripper, when you have a, a serial killer who is as infamous as Jack is, you're going to have a lot of people trying to tie that story into whatever they, well, you know, basically whatever they want. It, this is not something that just is related to sightings, too. We talked about a little bit before going live. The Ten Bells has been brought up in other forms of media. Yes, this is true. You might be familiar with the graphic novel by Alan Moore from Hell. Yes, uh, also famously made into a kind of okay movie, I guess. Kind of okay <laughs> movie. The pub is mentioned as being uh, it's being a part of the setting for From Hell, because that uh, graphic novel or that series, depending on how you look at it, discusses the murders because it's set during the, uh, the, the whole time and place of those things. You know, Sightings is reporting this. They're not far removed from the potential truth of things because this pub is... Right there, where if a ghost sighting were to occur, I mean, is it far removed from the idea, at least if we're, if we're working within the internal logic of all this, is it far removed from the idea that this pub was the source of one of Jack's murder victims? Um, it could easily tie together. I don't think they're completely going out on a limb here when they're talking about this in terms of, like I said, if we're looking at their own internal logic. Yeah, I don't think they specifically talk to anyone that confirms or denies either way. I don't remember that. I just remember people saying that they saw the old lady, old Liz, or whatever, long Liz, in the window on a second story. And then it's kind of done with in a miraculous, like, four minutes or something. It's it's really not that long a segment. I can tell you that Marion, uh, the psychic they bring in, is named uh, Marion Dampier Jeans. And I am, I'm trying to find the Google translated page for this because she was born in Denmark. Um, and here's the Wikipedia article from the uh, the Swedish Wikipedia, or as I like to call it, is uh, oh the Swedish thing. <laughs> but she's a Danish British author and spiritual medium. She also has written some books and appeared in a couple of television programs, including The Power of Spirits and Perception of Murder. It says here that she was born in Denmark in 1950, and she moved to England as a 19-year-old and began taking small jobs at spiritualist churches about London. And apparently she's been working as a medium for years after that. So she has a documented history of being a spiritualist medium. So it's not like sight sightings just called somebody off the street to just like, you know... You want to come in and pretend to be a psychic for a bit? Uh, so to their credit, it's not like they were just like half-assing this thing. They pulled in um, a quote-unquote legitimate psychic. And they also talked with a historian who you know talks a little bit about... Uh, and again, you already pointed this out, too, that they're throwing a lot of information at you really fast when they do this. But mm -hmm. they do pull in a historian who talks a little bit about the murders that were happening in and around the area, including the fact that you know these things did happen around this area. They talked to a guy named uh, Don Rumbelow, who's an author and historian, and there's another guy that they speak with as well who talks about it a little bit. Again, not far removed from if you tie all these pieces together, could these ghost reportings or these ghost sightings that they're seeing be related to the victims of Jack the Ripper? It very well could be true. Yeah, and that's the thing that kind of surprised me about this, is that it seems like a total sensationalist clickbait headline today. These ghosts are the victims of Jack the Ripper, uh, if they were, like, you know, try to put that out there. But with the way they present this, they, they actually make a legitimately strong argument for it. You think so? I, I, I mean, I, I, I ask... Okay, personally, do I think so? No, I don't. But do they make, do they make a legitimate <laughs> argument for it? I would say they do. I would say they got the right people to talk about this. Again, when I say random psychic, I couldn't even, like catch her name the first time because it's just hitting you but if she really is a medium and she does have a history of work i mean that's pretty legit um i still don't know though i it they got like i said they got all the right people there to talk about it and if they really felt something then so they say but i don't know i i, I will give them credit though for 
trying to put more into this one than the last one because the last one could be any number of reasons this one they try to get the right people to convince you otherwise yeah i was actually kind of surprised by it when i started looking up some of the names to see if they checked they do and it, it's so interesting watching these things from back then especially with a show that's just like you know kind of a ridiculous premise like we talked about it's a totally they're taking this way too seriously it's mm-hmm. like unsolved mysteries but the cast got hit in the head with a brick and then went on air <laughs> I got it, Matt. It was great. <laughs> it's just like, it's like, I got an idea for a show. Let's do legitimate true crime and supernatural, and then gets hit with a brick. It's like, wow, what was I talking about? That true crime stuff? No, roll the ghost footage. Just go with it. <laughs> we gotta get something. You know, they end on like inconclusive notes on it, and then they the third and final story that they ca- they cover like I have to say this is probably about like a good which should be 10 minutes worth of material, and they cram it into, like, three minutes. Mm-hmm. Uh, they talk about... God, this is so ridiculous how they present this. They talk <laughs> about the recovery, and this is this part is true. In 1991, uh, September of 91, there were some hikers. Uh, I think there were Italian hikers that were traveling... Oh, no, there were German tourists who were going through Oztal Alps. I'm probably ter- terribly mispronouncing that. I apologize to anybody who's terribly offended by that. But they were traveling through the Alps, and they found a body, like a mummified body, just out in the open there, frozen. It turned out to be the, the corpse of a, a person that they've nicknamed Otzi because of the name of the, the mountain range. Mm-hmm. And this person was presumably born in 3,345 B.C. Uh-oh. Looks like Jesus wasn't there for that one. <laughs> <laughs> Ass. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> He could have been. I mean, his dad anyway. No, I'm just kidding. Um, you know what? I I just put it down as Italian Alps because I couldn't get the name right. <laughs> uh, but he, he presumably died from the dating that they did of this body in about 3300 BC. And I'm surprised about the number, the amount of detail and analysis that's been going on on this Iceman, even into like the, the mid to late 2000s. Yeah, it went on for quite a while. Um, Just to describe what he looks like when he's kind of brought out to the camera, he looks exactly as you would expect, like a very frail, um, just bones with skin over it, very dark brown caveman looking type of guy. And he, if I remember correctly, isn't he kind of like bundled up like he's trying to keep warm or something? Kind of like that, yeah. Yeah. And that's that's basically what he looks like. But he seems pretty preserved for as long as he's been sheltered in the ice. Yeah, that was the thing that was remarkable about him because they they said that you could actually see like the remnants of like the eye, like the eye was partially open. Like you could actually see things that you should not normally see. Like he was flash frozen. Like his he was died and was frozen before he the body had time to like start to deteriorate. Mm-hmm. It's like uh, Mr. Freeze shot him with his ice gun or something. Kind of, yeah. And, like, obviously there would still be stuff that was, like, rotting away, of course, obviously. But mm-hmm. as it says here, when his body was found, uh, it weighed only about 30 pounds. And because it was covered in ice, it had only partially deteriorated. So you have things that were still there, like uh, the tooth enamel. They could actually do a CAT scan to see what was in his stomach. They found the meat from, like, an Ibex mountain goat. That seemed to be partially digested in his stomach. This this is remarkable that he was found in such a state. Correct me if I'm wrong here, because this is the part I don't remember, and my notes certainly don't reflect it. But were they making an argument for should they clone him, or was it that it would be immoral to clone him? They, oh my God, this is where the <laughs> this is where the story gets so ridiculous. It's like yeah. they had to. <laughs> <laughs> it's like they were trying to say the discovery of this guy wasn't enough to be newsworthy. Let's yeah. talk about cloning. <laughs> I, I, again, I, I can't remember if someone says it, but they're like, there's like a voice that says frogs were cloned. It's like, <laughs> there's your argument, I guess. <laughs> I think they were talking about the feasibility of could they do it. People they uh, they were interviewing was a guy named Boyce Rensberger who is a fairly famous science writer. He's written for different magazines, and he also wrote for the children's show 321 Contact. They talked to him a little bit about this, his his take on things, and he says one of the most ridiculous things of like, well, if you took his his DNA and you put it into the, the ovum of a, of a woman, 
Uh, you could have potentially a, a clone a caveman, but he would know nothing of this time period. Of course he would know nothing about this time period because he's not fucking born yet, you idiot. Yeah, I wonder if he, even with the womb of a woman of today, would he somehow have better capabilities at learning? Like, what, how does that work, you know? Or is he just going to come out like the same, you know, primitive man that he was once back in the day? I, I for one, don't think that humanity has changed or evolved as much as we like to think that we have. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the big differences between today and yesteryear is just how we store information, but like, or like even how we carry that information through, because like in ancient Greece, you know, you just had people sitting around telling stories and people do that today in different forms. We just do it through YouTube instead of through like, you know, sitting around a campfire, but even then we still do that. So a lot of those things in terms of like how how we do things hasn't really significantly altered the the basics of it. Like, we're still communicating stories about shit that we see and shit that we do. But it's just done in different ways. And for them to bring up the idea that this caveman would, like, if he were born today, he'd have no knowledge of this era. Well, no, but he would... A baby, when they're born, doesn't have any uh, any knowledge of this era, jackass. It's not like they're born <laughs> with, like, you know, abilities to use computers imprinted on their freaking DNA. It doesn't work like that. Yeah. Uh, again, you know, if he's going to come back to our time, even if he is primitive, I mean, you know, we have animals today that can learn things. A, a monkey flew out into outer space, so there's <laughs> absolutely... No reason why he couldn't adapt to society in some way. Uh, I do get a laugh, though, every time someone says, well, we lived in a civilized society. Civilized. All right. Yeah, whatever. What what time do you have? <laughs> you know, yeah, we're not as evolved. You're correct. We're not as evolved as we'd like to believe. This story, <laughs> again, happens in like two or three minutes. It's so fast, but it is fun to speculate on the idea if they did clone a caveman, or if they did somehow get a woman to carry a caveman to birth, uh, what would that be like? And how would he fit into the world? Obviously, he'd be a celebrity from probably till his death. Uh, there'd be plenty of YouTube videos and information out there immediately every day, uh, people speculating. And I think that's the job of this story is the speculation of, you know, what cloning in general, and then also... What if we cloned a caveman? <laughs> and let's be fair. I don't think he'd be... I don't think it would honestly be very different. Um, I think if they, they were born... If they took this DNA and somehow extrapolated it into making a person... Yeah, I think he'd just be born. Maybe he'd have a bit more hair on his body. Maybe he'd be a bit shorter. But I think he'd have the same brain capacity that we do today. And he'd just be like growing up. It's like, everybody tells me I was born as a caveman. I haven't lived in a cave all my life. I don't know why they keep saying these things. Yeah, that, you know, that's good to point out. There probably would be people that would be against him in some sort of nature like that. Yeah, they, they just, I'm just a simple caveman lawyer. <laughs> I just work for Geico. <laughs> <laughs> they gave me an awesome job. I sell insurance. <laughs> I mean, people keep talking about this and I just, you know. All I want to do is sell them a, a policy on their home or their car. I have a club, and it's like, no, but I do have this great premium I can offer you. <laughs> but me also like Taco Bell. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I have an inexplicable urge to beat things with the club, but who doesn't in this day and age, right? <laughs> I love you, Julie, but <laughs> let me pull on your hair really harshly. <laughs> yeah, uh, we shouldn't make fun of the cave people. Those are our ancestors. What are we doing? Yeah, we came we came from them. And this story, I mean, it's, still, it's remarkable. If you actually look through the the, the details that they have you know, provide for Otzi and uh, the amount of study that they've done to like try to find out more about where he came from in terms of, you know, what happened, what were people like back then, uh, a bit more about their, their physical structure. Even up until 2010, they were proposing different methods of how this uh, this guy died and like how he wound up where he did. So there's a lot of fascinating things about the fact that they actually did find a guy buried in the ice. And they even made a film about it in 2017. I haven't seen it, but apparently it, do it does exist called Iceman. It's a German, uh, partially a German production. And it talks about the discovery of this guy. It's a fictional story about... <laughs> 
this is just goes to show it's a fictional story about how this guy wound up becoming frozen in the ice. So, you know, they've extrapolated this man's story into a fictional background to where it's like, okay, let's tell a story about Otzi and how he wound up in the ice. You know, even aside from that, it's still an interesting case of looking at human evolution in, in a very rare form. So uh, it's it's a fascinating story into itself, especially if you're into human evolution and biology. They didn't need to gussy up the story with, with talks of cloning. <laughs> Frogs could be cloned too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know about you, uh, but this was... And this is our first episode of Sightings. Uh, we'll be doing more, but I, this was a great introduction for me. I, I don't know. You've seen it before, but for me, I was just on board. I was watching and I was like, all right, let's figure this fucker out. Because, it again, you know, if you're going to go watch Sightings, just remember that you have to absorb a lot of information in a very short amount of time. Yeah, uh, they, they do not give you much room to breathe. There are future episodes... Because uh, I think they realize that they're like what you're saying. This is kind of a problem in trying to digest all this information. So later episodes do become an hour long, and there's much more that they can cover in an, in an expanded time format like that. And it doesn't come off as I guess as cheap and kind of like an unsolved mysteries knockoff as this kind of does. Those later episodes actually work a lot better because they're given time to breathe. Um, what was the guy's name who hosts the show? Tim White. Tim White. Uh, he's a very good host for the show, and I actually enjoy seeing him as his role in it. He's he's definitely in there for keeps. I would love, and I, I hope this happens, I want to try to track down Tim White to get an interview with him about this show. Oh, man, that would be phenomenal. Apparently, he's he was born in Detroit. He's 70 years old. He served in the Air Force. He was an NBC affiliate and in Cleveland, Ohio. Okay, I guess from according to this, from ninety nine to two thousand eight, he was the co anchor of the evening news broadcast for NBC in uh Ohio in Ohio. So if we can get a hold of him, I would love to just talk to him and be like, Hey, um, what was it like? Did you have to go out to these these settings yourself? Did you get to do any investigations? Did they just like have you as the anchor? Um, did you ever look at these scripts and be like, What the hell are they trying to get me to say? Did you uh accustom yourself to believing in any of this you know was there any credence that you felt that the show didn't have time to give to a certain story you know all those all those questions need to be answered at this point i really want to know or at least like did he go into this show beforehand did he think that the the stuff was true or did this like completely change his perspective on it like if he was a, a skeptic beforehand i would love to find out about this stuff yeah, that that's a, also that would be the prime question. I think that would get it started. I agree. So hopefully we can try to. I would love to just get a hold of this guy and talk about it. Um, yeah, we'll have to track him down. Um, but for this first episode of Sightings Web, would you recommend this to people? I mean, uh, Sightings terrified me as a kid, man, because I mean it aired originally, like we were saying, in the early '90s. So if it was airing in '90, let's say it caught an episode in. 90, 95. I would have been 10 years old. And should a 10-year-old be really watching stories about ghosts and alien abductions? No wonder I was a terrified kid whenever this show came out, but I couldn't stop watching it at the same time. I do recommend people find this. Like, this is one that if we have a choice between, you know, leaving the crypt cro leaving the crypt closed, opening the crypt, I, I would say this is one that you should open up the crypt on this one. You know, dive in, explore this, because there's a lot of episodes of this show According to, again, referring to Wikipedia on it, if you count the special episodes, there's approximately 114 episodes of this show, mm -hmm. which is a lot of supernatural content. And mind you, it's dated, but given the fact that these stories, you know, are, are documents of, you know, something that happened at the time, going back in time to st study these, uh, these news events, it's not like it's just like fictional storytelling, like watching... Uh, you know, like an old Outer Limits episode that doesn't age well. This is an actual, like, new quote-unquote news program. I, I fully recommend diving in. Yeah, I, I would also recommend keeping the crypt open on this one. Shockingly, this was, and this is going to sound crazy even to me, but this was just as exciting as watching an episode of The X-Files. Uh, there's just something interesting about 
learning how people view the unknown, you know, how they experience it and what they gather from their eye and their perspective. I just love that sort of thing, because even if I don't believe in it, it's it's fascinating to me to see like even a character study of other people's and different generations, you know, looking at these things, these phenomenons that nobody in the world could possibly share with them. And if they did share with them, would it would they still feel the same way? So it's just it's a good deep inside look. And again, some of these stories do have some validity to them. You know, 10 bills, there was murders around there. Jack the Ripper was around. There wasn't a caveman frozen in the snow. Uh, There are lights in the sky and UFOs that the government has said, you know, unidentified flying objects that they cannot explain. So there is something there. We just don't know what it is, but it's worth exploring in this episode. So I would keep the crypt open. The Crypt is open on this for future episodes as we'll explore some other interesting sighting ones and see what they what they discuss, because there's a lot to dig into with this program, ranging from, gosh, if I remember correctly, man, there's one episode where somebody claims that they and his wife are the reincarnations of King Arthur and Queen Guinevere. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I I mean, (laughs) it's my memory. I'm going for memory on this. I. I might be wrong, but I'm pretty sure there was an episode where these guy, these people literally said that they were the the reincarnations of Arthur and Guinevere. Wow. So does that remind you of uh, any Justice League episodes by any chance? <laughs> 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 yes, it does, sadly, now that you put that together, and I hate you for it. Uh, <laughs> you, great show. Uh, it is. That'll be another crypt that we'll have to open up at some point in time. Yes. But we want to hear your thoughts. If you've seen Sightings before, what were your thoughts on it? Have you revisited it lately? Did you know you could find the episodes on YouTube? Because you can. You know, type in Sightings TV show and you can start to find episodes of this. Rewatch one if if you haven't or watch one for the first time and give your thoughts and feedback. And let us know how you feel about the paranormal, like um, from the things that we discussed. Look up the M Triangle. Give your thoughts. Look up the Ten Bell. We'd, we'd love to hear that feedback and for you to share your stories. You know, if there are, when we do an episode about the paranormal and our experiences, if you have a story that you'd like to share, let us know, because we would happily retell your story for you when we discuss it with some of our own experiences, too. You can email thecriticalandroid at gmail.com or find me on Twitter uh, at criticalandroid. Steph and JD, how can they find you? Uh, mine is Cyberpunk Holiday on Instagram, and you can find me there. Just PM me anything. I usually just post my art, so come find me. All right. So with this crypt open, we advise you to look into it and see what uh, relics you can uncover. On behalf of myself, Webb, the Critical Android, and Steph and JD, the crypt is closed. Goodbye, everyone. (laughs) Bye, Dr. Nick.